we now move to our grand rounds, which uh, I think you will uh, greatly enjoy. It's an important topic, uh, the role of iodinated contrast in phosphates and iatrogenic renal injury. I don't think the speakers need introduction to you. John Edwards, I've introduced here before. He will begin, and then he'll be followed by Phil Clemmer uh, to, to review this topic. Uh, John. Well, good afternoon. I, I'd like to add my voice to the appreciation of the chief residents and thanks for all their hard work. And I have to say my own personal interactions with each of them has really been a pleasure and I wish them very best of luck in the coming year. Um, well, so I hope you find this an interesting topic. Phil and I were both uh, felt a little, uh, I don't know, intimidated is the right word, but after last week's presentation that involved tremendous uh, uh, breadth between basic science and, and clinical knowledge, we're bringing you back down to something very mundane, but I think very important and relevant to uh, our current practice. And so I'm going to spend the first half talking about iodinated contrast and issues related to uh, nephrotoxicity of iodinated contrast. And then Phil is going to talk about phosphates and perhaps bisphosphonates, depending on how the time goes, and uh, what we should be aware of in dealing with uh, um, uh, these agents. So. Of course, the problem is, I think, well recognized by everyone here. Contrast agents are really important. They provide us very useful information, sometimes critical information, to make decisions and, and, and uh, implement treatment plans for patients. But there is a very real, although uh, uncommon, but a very significant risk of acute kidney injury related to ionated contrast. Um, this has been known for a very long time. Um, uh, studies of nephrotoxicity go, uh, that go back into the 60s and 50s. But despite the long uh, uh, period of time in which this has been studied, the actual pathogenesis of contrast nephrotoxicity is still not really understood. Clearly, there are at least three processes that may be going on that contribute, but exactly they're the role of these in human run-of-the-mill contrast nephrotoxicity is, is really not certain. So what do we know is that uh, ionated contrast does cause acute vasoconstriction in the kidney um, and probably contributes somewhat to, to uh, the um, kidney injury. There's also direct cellular toxicity of these agents that can be shown both in whole organisms and in cultured cells. And then the possibility that these things may become concentrated, precipitate, and cause intertubular obstruction um, has never really been disproven and may contribute to uh, acute renal failure of ionated contrast. And let me show you a couple of things just to point out this, the time course of vasoconstriction in particular. Um, this is a very old study. Well, actually, it's not that old. This one's from 1990, um, looking at uh, dogs and infusing a, a not directly toxic dose of contrast just to, just to see the hemodynamic effects of ionated contrast. And so, Plotted versus time here is renal blood flow, GFR, and uh, a marker of oxidative stress, um, um, malonyl dialdehyde, I believe, is the compound. Notice the time course here. This is five minutes. That's 10 minutes. So this is very fast. Uh, there's an uh, intense immediate vasoconstriction when you infuse iodinated contrast. It happens within just a few minutes and disappears within a few minutes. So this, this effect of contrast is very quick and evanescent. Um, there's a, dro a drop in GFR that is more prolonged, and here this evidence of, of um, oxidative injury develops within a few minutes and takes some time to decay. But these events happen very early, and these are in dogs that don't get acute renal failure. This is what happens in the animals who avoid acute renal failure. What happens on a cellular level is also happens very quickly. This is a, uh, uh, also from rats. This is from rats. Um, in, in a control animal, just to show you the normal anatomy, um, notice the proximal tubule cells here that fill the, uh, um, th th this loop uh, defined by the basement membrane. And these are distal tubules here. There's a glomerulus up in the corner. On a higher power view, you can see these are proximal tubule cells that uh, have a few vacuoles in them, but are not largely vacuolated. This is following IV contrast 
one hour after the contrast was given. And there was a dramatic cellular change in these cells. So in lower power, you can see the proximal tubule cells now are riddled with holes. And in high power, these are vacuoles. So this is intense vacuolization of proximal tubule cells following iodinated contrast. Again, this has been known for a long time. The point I want to, point, to make to you today is that this is very fast. This happens within an hour when you get iodinated contrast. So the typical course, the clinical course of contrast nephropathy is fairly rapid rise in serum creatinine, uh, often peaks about 48 hours, and then um, it typically resolves over the course of several days. Uh, there, there are not clear uh, or, uh, biochemical markers of, a, of contrast injury. Uh, the urine output, the urine sediment, urine sodium, fractional excretion of sodium are all quite variable. You may see no sediment. You may see typical uh, coarsely granular casts. Um, so the it's difficult to diagnose. There's not specific findings for, I mean, for uh, uh, nephrotoxicity. Um, the pr also, it very typically completely resolves over the course of a few days, and we have no effective therapy once the disease is in process. Um, it's very common. It's reported to be the third most common cause of hospital-acquired acute renal failure. Um, and so the patients who get it can be fairly well-defined. Well the risk varies dramatically with frequency of well-defined risk factors. Um, it's common, as, as I said, about uh, the third most common cause of hospital-acquired renal failure. And uh, so how common is that? And people who get IV contrast, it's been reported that as much as 10%, 11% of cases will get acute renal failure. The incidence has fallen over time. Um, 30 years ago, the incidence of, of nephrotoxicity was much higher. And now uh, all comers uh, sorts of series report much lower levels than this um, in the single digit range. One problem is that uh, population studies are limited to those in which patients got a creatinine after they got their contrast. So the lowest risk patients are never included in these kinds of uh, population studies. Um, also, the definition of contrast-induced nephropathy causes some difficulties in trying to interpret this data as far as practical utility. And the, the, the main thing I want to point out is that in most of these studies, the definition of nephropathy is a rise of creatinine of a half a milligram per deciliter, or 25% of the baseline level. So that's a very permissive uh, uh, definition, even in patients who have fairly significant kidney failure, a change of a half a milligram per deciliter or 25 percent isn't necessarily a big problem. A person with a creatinine of four, if their creatinine goes from four to five but then comes back and has no sequelae, I mean, is this, is this important even? Is this kind of kidney disease what we're interested in? Uh, so the, even the studies are focused on these transient events, and we're really interested in the more rare but very important, very significant, uh, severe nephropathy resulting in kidney failure. Are they related or not? And I can't give you a definite answer to that. But what I can tell you is, uh, even though the course usually is benign with creatinine returning to baseline levels, some patients do have severe kidney injury requiring dialysis, and sometimes it's irreversible. So in one study of high-risk patients, 35% of people who had severe renal failure requiring dialysis, 35% of them either died or remained on dialysis. So there's a, a, a fraction of patients in whom the disease is very severe and has very important consequences. And, and then a lower fraction, but 18% of patients who had a severe enough renal failure that required acute dialysis were still on dialysis a year later. So... Once again, to point out that, the although this is rare, the consequences can be very significant. And if you use the more uh, uh, permissive identification of, of, of contrast-induced nephropathy, um, even that is a predictor of poor long-term outcome. And this is a study, uh, a retrospective study, looking at people who got contrast-induced nephropathy and, what their one, and their one-year mortality. Now, this is a pretty high-risk population they started with. So you notice that even those patients who had no change in um, uh, their creatinine following contrast had a 15% mortality in the year. So these patients were very sick, this whole population. But in those patients who had significant contrast-induced nephropathy, they had a dramatically increased mortality over a year. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that the renal failure caused their mortality. It does mean that people who get contrast nephropathy are sick. 
and have serious diseases that are associated with long-term mortality. So the, we can identify the people who are at high risk of developing contrast nephropathy. And uh, a, a whole host of retrospective analyses and multivariate analysis have uh, identified several factors. Pre-existing renal disease probably the mo was the first recognized and seems to be one of the strongest uh, uh, risk factors. But also the presence of diabetes, hypotension at the time that one gets the contrast, advanced age, presence of congestive heart failure, and importantly, the, both the amount and the type of IV contrast that a person gets are all closely related to the uh, risks for developing contrast nephropathy. And a very useful scoring system was recently proposed that I want to show you. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Um, and I, I find this to be very useful, one, quantitating in my own mind uh, what a patient's risk is, but also talking to patients and their families so they can get an idea of what we're talking about and put a, a number on the kinds of elevated risk when we're talking about patients who are looking at a study that requires contrast. So this came from a multivariate analysis of a very large group of, of patients at Columbia University. Um, and uh, using, uh, they identified uh, these factors that were all uh, positively associated with the onset of nephropathy, assigned uh, point scores to them, and the, and the, uh, the Calculation is based on simply adding the point scores based with each of these factors. So if a patient has got hypotension at the time of their contrast study, they get five points. If they needed a balloon pump at or following the contrast study, they get five points. If they have congestive heart failure. Uh, the important uh, thing to note here, one is that I, that I hadn't been previously aware of, is anemia is actually a fairly strong predictor of onset of nephropathy. Age is also strongly associated. And of course, renal uh, failure. Um, in, this, in this scheme, they uh, suggest two different ways of scoring for chronic renal disease, either uh, stratifying based on estimated GFRs or simply a value of four if the creatinine is greater than one and a half. As, as you'll see, either one of those scoring methods uh, works all right. Um, so how well does this, thing, does this work? This is their raw data, and it's interesting to look at the shape of this curve. So, the risk score is plotted versus the con uh, contrast-induced nephropathy uh, risk. So patients who have a score of 1 have a very low risk of nephropathy. Patients who have a score of 22 have a, almost 100% chance of nephropathy. So, this is, so the co score in their, this, this is their population that they use to develop the, the, the uh, scoring system, is, is very strongly rated, rated with onset of nephropathy. But this is also not linear. This is, uh, appears to be a logarithmic sort of scale. So it increases more dramatically the higher the score gets. Uh, so th these risk factors are not simply additive. They are more than additive. Uh, and then the, they, they use the score then to query a different data set to see how predictive it was. And so um, in, on the next couple of slides, the black bars are uh, risks associated with in the uh, data set that was used to generate the scoring system, and the white bars are those in a uh, second uh, validation uh, data set. So you see that it, it, it actually works quite well. It's predicting risk. Those patients who have a score less than five have a low risk of, of nephropathy. Those patients who have a very high score have a risk of up to uh, over 50% chance of developing contrast-induced nephropathy. Once again, this, their, their um, definition of contrast nephropathy is still a, a rise in creatinine of a, of a half milligram percent or a 25 percent decline uh, 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 rise in creatinine. They also looked at whether this was a good predictor for the need for dialysis, a more, I think, it's, it's a concrete uh, uh, endpoint. And you see that it's very strong, their score is very strongly related to the need for onset of dialysis following contrast. So once again, those patients who got the very high score, greater than 16, had risks of be, in, in the teens of needing dialysis during hospitalization, whereas those with lower scores had much lower risks. And once again, this is not a linear result. It's much more than additive, the, the risk. So, so there's some interesting things that, that follow from this. If you look at their scoring system and the, and the shapes of those curves, um, let's remember we, we focus very much on under, underlying chronic renal disease as being one of the most important risks for developing nephropathy. But notice that the score that you get for having even very advanced chronic renal failure is only six. That only puts you in a moderately 
uh, enhanced risk. So renal failure by itself only modestly increases the risk. It's the presence of co-risk factors and the, and the, the concomitant presence of risk factors that greatly increase, increases your risk of, of developing uh, renal failure following contrast. And although advanced renal, chronic renal disease by itself only puts you in moderate risk if you have advanced age, diabetes, renal insufficiency, and congestive heart failure, patients who we encounter fairly frequently, they are in the highest possible risk category. So um, the, it's the coexistence of risk factors rather than risk factors considered independently that greatly determine your risk. So if we can identify patients who are at high risk, perhaps we can identify those things that we could do that would minimize their risk of contrast nephropathy in those populations. Well, the, the, the first thing that was, that was recognized many years ago is that the patient's effective circulating volume at the time they receive the contrast is probably the most important determinant of whether you get contrast nephropathy or not. In experimental animals, it's almost impossible to cause contrast nephropathy if the, if the animal is not volume depleted when they get the contrast. And that probably correlates strong, well with humans. Um, so making sure the patient is not volume depleted is the single most important thing that you can do. Um, and so one commonly used approach is simply to give the patient saline. Uh, and there's lots of different strategies that you'll see published. Uh, 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 one ml per kilogram per hour for several hours, both before and after contrast, is a reasonable way to approach this. Uh, some people will suggest that you need to have a urine output of around 150 cc's an hour for several hours following the contrast uh, infusion. Um, and um, ex the exact details of how much volume and how long you give it probably isn't so important. A couple of things have become apparent. One is that normal saline is probably better than half normal saline. So you really need to expand the patient's volume. You don't need to give them a water diuresis. You need to give them extracellular volume. And um, you want to ensure that patients continue to have uh, reasonable urine output. Of course, it's easier said than done in some patients. So the pa people who, who, in which you can't do this very facilely is, are those patients who have underlying congestive heart failure, who have renal failure with volume expansion, nephrotic syndrome, those sorts of things, so in, in which you really just can't uh, pour in IV saline. So, and those patients need to, it's, it's difficult to make blanket recommendations. It's important that the patients remain volume expanded when they get the contrast. A second thing that clearly is useful is to minimize contrast dose. Uh, some authors uh, had, came up with an interesting uh, rubric or uh, 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 quantity they call the maximum radiographic contrast dose, uh, which they propose to be five times the patient's body weight in kilograms divided by their serum creatinine. Well, I'm not sure where they got that, but if, <laughs> it turns out that the, the amount of contrast that you get uh, cor um, uh, related to that, that uh, number uh, correlates very strongly with your risk of contrast nephropathy. So if a patient gets the, their MRCD or slightly more than that, the risk of contrast nephropathy requiring dialysis is really very low. But once you get very far above that, the risk of dialysis, of, of, of renal failure requiring dialysis remark markedly elevates. So we can think about how much that is. If a person weighs 70 kilograms and they got a creatinine of one, the MRCD is going to be uh, 350 mLs. You know, that's a lot, that's pretty generous. We rarely see patients get that much contrast in even fairly significant studies. However, if the patient's creatinine is five, then the MRCD is simply their body weight, 70 cc's. That's hardly enough to do a, a cardiac cath with. So you can see that the, the dose of contrast is very important, particularly in people who have, have increased or uh, uh, decreased renal function. A second uh, uh, important issue is the identity of the contrast agent. And um, the chemistry of these contrast agents has improved over time. The initial agents that were used were very hyper, uh, hypertonic, and they were associated with, with really significantly higher risks of, of contrast and frappy than we're used to seeing now. Um, and you know, uh, a decade ago or so, it became quite clear that what was called low osmolar contrast uh, had much lower risk. Now, the low osmolar contrast is still hypertonic. Um, it's just not as hypertonic as the old stuff. Uh, in the past few years, a a isotonic ionated contrast material has become available. So it's 
it's actually isotonic to plasma. Its tonicity is around 290 or so, and is and and so is le is not hypertonic at all, unlike the so-called low osmolar contrast agents. Um, in a number of studies, it's clear that, patient, that high risk patients have a lower incidence of nephropathy if they use the iso, isotonic contrast. So in those patients we identify as high risk, we really should make sure when we, ask, when we send the patients for studies to ask the radiologist to use the, slow, the isotonic contrast. It is quite a bit more expensive. And then there's a number of other things that uh, people have looked at to try to minimize risk of contrast. One reason why I'm talking about this today, actually, actually I meant to say this at the very beginning, is that there were two, two papers in the past six months that uh, questioned or brought into question a couple of things that we thought we knew about this. And so I'm going to highlight a couple of them now. Um, it, it was proposed a few years ago that sodium bicarbonate is pro it may be a better agent than sodium chloride when we're expanding volume prior and after contrast exposure. Um, the rationale for that uh, not being an, a, a chemist, I can't really comment on it exactly, but that, that the presence of bicarbonate can function as a free radical scavenger, and so perhaps limit oxidative injury in the kidney following contrast. Uh, whatever the rationale, uh, this was, uh, was studied nicely in a randomized controlled trial that, in which the effect was so great that it was... Uh, terminated early, but before the study was planned to be terminated. And this is the data from that initial study um, in which they we, we plotted uh, or compared patients who got sodium chloride hydration and those who got sodium bicarbonate hydration. And this is their serum creatinines before and after contrast. They, they, they checked creatinines at 24 and 48 hours and plotted the highest one. So this is not at any particular time. It's either 24 or 48 hours after contrast. And those patients who met the definition of contrast-induced nephropathy are plotted in the blue bars here. Um, so it's, it's quite clear that the patients, the more patients had met the definition of nephropathy in, the, in those group who got saline versus those who got bicarb. And then they also reported their estimated GFR uh, percent change following contrast, which you know, is derived from these same kinds of data. Um, and the definition of nephropathy would be plotted below this dotted line here. So once again, it's clear that those patients who got sodium chloride, there were more patients who developed nephropathy than in those patients who got bicarbonate. On the basis of this, I think a lot of our practice has changed over the past couple of years. And using IV bicarb prior to contrast in, in high-risk patients has become very widely used. Um, and there's been a couple of follow-up studies in which bicarbonate was one of the arms that, that corroborated this initial result. So uh, this is a pretty robust finding, I think. Um, however, this was published uh, in uh, the clinical journal of the American Society of Nephrology in January. Uh, sodium bicarbonate is associated with increased incidence of contrast nephropathy, a retrospective cohort study from the Mayo Clinic. So this is retrospective. It's not randomized at all. Patients on the basis of their, uh, of, of their clinician's uh, practice strategy, got various approaches to try to minimize the risk of nephropathy. And in this group of 11,000 patients that they were able to identify, 10,000 got no treatment at all. Now, what they consider no treatment is standard saline hydration. So this includes people who got saline before and after their contrast. But the, the other treatment arms, the other treatment groups identified were people who got sodium bicarbonate and N-acetylcysteine. That was 221 of these patients. People who got N-acetylcysteine alone, 616 patients. And then 268 patients who got bicarb but didn't get the NAC. These patients got hydrated with bicarbonate. Some of them exactly as prescribed in that initial study. Others by other approaches, but reasonable amounts of bicarb to make sure the patients were volume expanded when they got their dye. And this is a percent with contrast-induced nephropathy. So the vast majority of patients who didn't get anything special got about, about um, 11 percent of those patients got nephropathy. And the important change here is those patients that got bicarb, 31 percent of them got contrast-induced nephropathy. And here, this is uh, uh, presented in a different way. 
uh, your risk, your relative risk or odds ratio of developing nephropathy depending on your, on your treatment as compared to no treatment at all, which is the, the, the unity line here. So those patients who got bicarb plus and acetylcysteine, those patients who got anacetylcysteine only were no different than the control group. But those patients who got bicarbonate had an enormous risk of nephropathy. Three times. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I think now the, an interesting uh, a point of the paper to me, also based on my in reference, to my earlier comment about not being a chemist, is that their rationale for why bicarbonate might be harmful is the same as the rationale for why it might be helpful. Uh, apparently, there are pathways in which bicarbonate can release free radicals as well as consume free radicals. And depending on the relative rates of those reactions, bicarbonate might actually induce oxidative ant damage rather than suppress it. And that, that's, uh, that's their rationale for why this might be the case. This wasn't a randomized no, it was not randomized at all. You don't know what the risk scores in the groups Well, the risk scores in the groups were fairly comparable as far as numbers of patients had diabetes and so on. But Another, something that, that comes out of that, that uh, risk paper that I presented to you is that it's not simply the presence of diabetes or heart failure or hypotension, but it's, it's the concomitant presence of them. So, and none of the papers ever report how many patients had multiple risk factors. That really makes it very hard to compare to these studies because we want to know how many patients had multiple risk factors, not only how many had individual risk factors. So... All I can say at this point is that this has cooled the enthusiasm for sodium bicar bicarbonate as a, uh, a preventive strategy, but I don't think that it's, it's a strong, not, certainly not a strong enough study to say that, that the previous randomized trials were incorrect. Um, but it must give one pause when you're using, the, using this approach. A couple other things that uh, have been suggested to limit risk, I'll go through briefly. One is N-acetylcysteine. Of course, this has been studied many times, and it's been the subject of numerous meta-analyses as well. Uh, it's not clear that it's useful. Um, the idea, of course, is N-acetylcysteine is a reducing agent. It, the idea is that it might decrease oxidative injury um, following contrast. Um, it's inexpensive, and it's, we think, non-toxic. Um, but uh, apparently, on very, looking at very large numbers of studies and large numbers of patients, it doesn't have an overall benefit. Um, I, I think I'm required to note that that is a, non, uh, a not approved use or uh, off-label proof of N-acetylcysteine. Um, other, other things that have been suggested in very small studies to be useful are theophylline and ascorbic acid, but these need to be studied in bigger trials before it's apparent that it we can recommend using them. One thing that's very clear is that you need to avoid diuretics when, when and immediately following contrast. Um, uh, many, some, some years ago, when it was thought that perhaps urine flow was the most important uh, uh, preventative measure from contrast, people were given, in, intentionally given, relatively high dose diuretics uh, following contrast, and it became clear quickly that those uh, trials were failures of patients who got the the diuretics had increased risks of contrast nephropathy. So, and, and that's probably because they, they induce a prerenal state uh, with the diuretics. So, so, the second paper that, was, that came out, this is in September of last year, uh, really upset an apple cart that we thought had been fairly stable, and that is uh, that whether, with the role of dialysis in preventing contrast nephropathy. Well, it, I, on the at first, uh, on the face of it, uh, use of dialysis may, may make sense. Uh, these contrast agents are of relatively low molecular weight. Um, they're about 1,500 molecular weight. They don't bind to proteins, so they're free in, in the serum. They distribute to the extracellular space. They're excluded from inside cells. And uh, so they ought to dialyze very well. In fact, they do dialyze very well. With a high-flux dialyzer, uh, this has been studied a couple times, with you, the kind of high-flux dialyzer we routinely use now, uh, the clearance of, of uh, the ionated contrast agents is about the same as urea. So it's cleared very well. Uh, with a standard hemodialysis treatment, you can clear it faster than the endogenous renal function. Um, so if the, the, the disease is caused by the prolonged presence of the contrast material because of decreased GFR, then we should be able to overcome that with dialysis. Uh, 
of course, this idea wasn't lost on people. people this has been studied many times. Um, and both, you know, s s some poorly controlled case studies, but also some, a, a number of very well-designed random, randomized trials um, that altogether showed no evidence for hemodialysis improving outcome, decreasing the incidence of nephropathy, decreasing the need for dialysis, decreasing long-term development of end-stage renal disease. Um, and some of these studies, uh, the dialysis was initiated as the contrast was given. So one, one potential problem with this is that you can't get the dialysis unit isn't in the cath lab, and so there's always a delay between the time you get the contrast and the time you get dialysis. To avoid that, one of these studies actually had the patient on dialysis as they got their contrast, and that did not decrease the risk of nephropathy. Why? Why would dialysis not work? Well, I think the best explanation comes from those first couple of slides I showed you. The effect of an infusion of contrast is immediate. The, the hemodynamic changes in the kidney happen within minutes. The cellular changes are detectable within an hour, well before you'd be able to decrease the contrast concentration much at all. Um, you know, the, the, what, what flows from that idea, though, if that's the case, then it's not the prolonged exposure to contrast that's the problem, but it's, it's something different in the chronic kidney diseased kidney that alters its ability to respond to this vasoconstriction and cellular toxicity. Um, and so the, it's not that the, pres, the patient is exposed to contrast for hours, it's just that they can't tolerate exposure to contrast at all. Um, but so another reason why dialysis might not work is that, of course, dialysis is not a benign procedure. It, it has its own complications. And primarily, well, one of the things that it does is when the blood is exposed to the membrane, it, it induces a whole host or cascade of inflammatory mediators. Um, if, the, if the inflammatory process in the kidney that's triggered by the contrast is made worse by this stimulation of the immune system and the, uh, the, uh, by dialysis, that might explain why we, 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 you can't make it better by dialysis. And then also, when you dialyze somebody who has advanced renal insufficiency and their BUN is elevated, even if you do a rel relatively mild dialysis treatment, as you remove urea, there's fluid shifts. The extracellular fluid goes into the cells so that there can be fairly a, a quick decrease intracellular volume. The dialysis might make the volume problem worse. And so that might induce a worse injury uh, than you might have otherwise. So those are all rationales of why we thought maybe dialysis wasn't working. But uh, in, in September, a group from Taiwan published this very well-designed study. 82 patients who were getting coronary angiography who had advanced renal insufficiency were randomized to either get saline hydration prophylaxis or just or get dialysis. They got dialyzed, and not, you know, not the most aggressive dialysis treatment in the world, uh, as soon as they could after, after angiography. Ended up being about an hour after they got their, their first bolus of contrast they got on the dialysis machine. And these groups were pretty well matched. The outcome was dramatic. Um, so I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but the bar graphs, the bars are so slow, small you can't see them. The patients who got dialysis had a very low percentage of patients who required dialysis for acute renal failure, whereas those patients who, got, who did not get the prophylactic dialysis, about 40% of them required, had acute renal failure and required dialysis. Those patients who didn't get off of dialysis, there was about 10% or so of the patients who, got, who did not get prophylactic dialysis who required long-term dialysis, whereas nobody who got prophylactic dialysis went on to ESRD. And this is this change in serum creatinine by the end of their hospitalization. Again, there's a really big difference. Each of these differences easily reach statistical significance. So I don't know what to say about this one either. Um, we've got a very large bit of pre previously well-established data to suggest that dialysis doesn't do anything. And here's a study that shows that it's wonderful. Um, and greatly decreases the risk of contrast. Well, one thing about this study is that their, their control group's risk of needing dialysis is very high. Um, I can't tell you what the number is exactly. It's well over 30%. That's, that's high compared to historical control. So you know, maybe this group was at, somehow at a higher risk. But we don't, uh, from reading the papers, it's not at all apparent what they did differently that would account for the difference in outcome. And I think at this point, we still have to say the bulk of evidence supports no role for prophylactic hemodialysis, but we need to be open to the possibility. So to summarize what my component of this, 
I mean, reiterate that nephrotoxicity is, is really very rare, but potentially very serious complication of use of ionated contrast associated with a poor long-term outcome. Pathogenesis is unknown, risk factors are well established, and we, and we have a reasonable tool for establishing, for quantitating risk. Recommendations to avoid nephrotoxicity. First of all, identify the patients at risk. Be sure you know what a patient's creatinine is before they, you send them for a contrast study. And avoid the use of contrast, unless you really need to do it. Think about that every time you order a contrast study. Uh, in patients who need contrast and are at high risk, main thing is, the, the, the surest recommendation is to provide volume expansion, and perhaps we should use bicarbonate. Um, avoid the use of diuretics. Of course, minimize the contrast load and use isoosmolar contrast. You can consider N-acetylcysteine. The evidence for it is very weak. This is a big question here. Prophylactic dialysis or not? It's a, it's, the procedure itself is, a, is expensive and has risks associated with it. Um, the benefit is really uncertain. One important point I wanted to make as well, though, in those patients who already have ESRD and are on dialysis, there's no need to, for extra dialysis. There's no need to remove the contrast in people who already have established renal failure. So I'm going to end there and uh, give the podium to Phil. I think we'll take questions at the end. That would be all right. Hi. I want to echo uh, John's uh, congratulations and uh, thanks to the chief residents. And I want to put a plug in for residents' uh, morning report. Um, in my humble opinion, it's the best teaching uh, vehicle in this uh, institution. So I recommend everybody try to show up. Um, <clears throat> I think I am going to be able to say I was uh, intimidated by last week's uh, speaker. I was more intimidated by seeing uh, John Edwards' name next to mine. I was concerned. It was a medical malpractice. Uh, <clears throat> um, thankfully, it, it's John, my, my friend. Uh, just to put everyone to sleep uh, after a meal, um, phosphate uh, is taken in at 1,400 milligrams a day, more than we used to because of uh, processed foods. Uh, all of us with closed epiphyses put out 1,400, and we are therefore uh, in uh, metabolic balance with respect at least to phosphate. Um, we absorb it at least 60 to 70 percent by the gut, irrespective of our vitamin D status, renal function, age, or whatever, and we regulate it at the proximal tubule in the kidney, and PTH is the signal, and, and, and uh, phosphatonins, which is a new hormone coming from bone, is another signal that maintains the set point of um, phosphorus between three and a half and, and Five, uh, we, uh, Bill Finn and I and a number of people were looking at the literature that the lower the better. We think that phosphate may be the uh, latter-day um, cholesterol for cardiovascular risk, but more of that later. So anyway, uh, this is how much we take in, and this is how much we put out in our urine, and we, we, we regulate it at the proximal tubule. Um, so to repeat that, we take in 1,400, we absorb 900 renal excretion, uh, oral phosphosoda prep for, um, for colonoscopy or for bowel surgery is 11,000 milligrams. And, um, and it's usually given in divided dosage um, uh, prior to the procedure, but it, it is a, uh, it's, it's sodium salt. It is a huge amount of phosphate. It works. <laughs> um, it, it gets some people to the dialysis program, and I can't identify ahead of time who they are. So thank you. I, I should have planted that. Uh, the, um, so life's full with, of ironies, I think, and so is the practice of medicine. We are trying to stamp out um, the second most common cause of cancer death in the United States, cold cancer, um, and may be contributing to the number six cause of uh, death in the United States, which is end stage renal disease. And furthermore, if you don't measure the creatinine and you don't have symptoms, you don't know anything bad happened. Uh, the badness is basically bone meal, calcium phosphate, uh, is very good for growing uh, uh, roses. I know that personally. Um, but it's very bad for your tubules. And I'll, I'll show you evidence of that. So um, there, there's an issue here of uh, toxicity. Uh, this is the bone meal in the proximal tubules. Uh, it stains specifically von Kossa stain uh, for calcium, but you could also do a specific stain for phosphate and show the same thing. So this is not a good thing. 
if you do a CT image uh, bilaterally, uh, you can actually show uh, the precipitation uh, for calcinosis. Uh, with ultrasound, you can vaguely see it, but, but it's physically visible in many cases. Most cases, it would require a biopsy of the kidney. And I might add, we don't biopsy people with non-proteinuric renal disease without active sediment. So the fact that um, we don't look for this disease may mean that it's there and we don't know it. And again, if you don't have your creatinine done after um, your colonoscopy, you're not sure anything happened to you until perhaps several years later when your doctor says you have nephrosclerosis. So back to the proximal tubule, the signal for phosphate, you filter a huge amount in the prox at the glomerular space. Uh, the signal is PTH. PTH removes these uh, uh, sodium uh, phosphate transporters uh, into lysosomes and therefore allows more phosphate to pass in the urine. And that's how the kidney autoregulates uh, phosphate um, set point. Uh, here's an example of four patients that got the regular uh, um, oral phosphate and this is their serum phosphate, it climbed to uh, seven, went back down with the second dose at four and went back up again um, at, at, during this 60-hour uh, study. <clears throat> this is another case that um, was published of two patients. Here again, a normal serum phosphate, they get their oral phosphate load, it goes up to as high as 12 and a half. Reciprocally, the stoichiometry of, of calcium and phosphate is it's super saturated even when we're normal, so the calcium always goes down. You would rarely get tetany because the phosphate protects against tetany, but you can still see how, how high things go. And then this would be what I would call a dehydration effect because it is an osmotic diuretic, and that's or osmotic uh, cathartic rather. So these people blip their creatinine and come right back down. So this is probably a, a volume issue from the, um, from the bowel prep. But this was a, a very interesting slide. This, this uh, relates the level of serum phosphate rise up to a level as high as 14 after the PrEP with age. And as you can see, there's a linear relationship. The older you are, the higher your serum phosphate goes. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing, and why is that? Well, no one really knows, and I, th these are my, my guesses. I think maybe if you're older, you have uh, a longer lag time in the bowel for the, for the Fleet's phosphosoda or whatever to be absorbed. You may actually absorb more. Uh, a low GFR, you could say, well, if you have a low GFR, you won't dump it in your urine, then your serum phosphate would go up. And, and again, I looked at the GFRs on these studies. They were all below 1.5, but of course we know 1.5 at 870 is a GFR of 40. So part of this may be a GFR issue. Um, I mean, there are other possibilities how age may take that up. Now, having said that, it's not in the serum that we worry about, it's in the tubule. So we think phosphate's bad in the blood year in and year out at a high level because it transforms smooth muscle cells and blood vessels into osteoblasts and causes blood vessels to uh, ossify. But this issue is a uh, tubular issue, so we can see refreshing the, the serum uh, phosphate level versus median age. The people who had the very highest levels were 63 years old. Those that were below five were 32 years old. So I'm going to rush through this very quickly just for review. Nephrocalcinosis comes in different forms. Any hypercalciuric syndrome, the most common would be a distal renal tubular acidosis. Infants treated with loop diuretics, that's a basically barter syndrome but by, by uh, drug, would have hypercalciuria and get nephrocalcinosis. The, the subgroup of sarcoid that makes 1-alpha hydroxylase in their granulomas will have an absorptive hypercalciuria, and they will get not only stones and hypercalcemia, but can get hyper, uh, nephrocalcinosis. Uh, Dent syndrome is a rare X-linked disease that causes um, renal-limited hyperparathyroidism, so they get very high vitamin D levels. Hyperoxalaturia, tumor lysis syndrome, hereditary tubulopathies, which would include the barters, cystic fibrosis, and the littles. I, I didn't realize cystic fibrosis and, and little syndrome were on this list, but they, they are. Medullary sponge kidney gives you nephrocalcinosis, but is harmless, and it's not to be confused with medullary cystic kidneys. Uh, any past injury can calcify. We know calcification uh, 
can be a response to injury. Uh, drinking uh, prestone antifreeze is a bad idea. Um, a treatment of X-link hypophosphatemic rickets, or in the old days when I was a resident, we used to give phosphate to control hypercalcemia. Uh, that was a bad idea in retrospect. And then uh, the subject of this talk. So I'm going to be able to review all the literature because there isn't much. There are about 50 case reports, one nested case control study, which I'll show you, two retrospective uh, cohort studies, a biopsy study by uh, Markowitz, but he went after the people who already had creatinines elevated. So again, none of these studies are perfect, and, and none of them are randomly uh, controlled uh, studies. One study from Walter Reed suggests the incidence is 1.6%. Uh, I hope that isn't true because there are 14 million colonoscopies per year in the United States. I realize all of them do not, some of them get go lightly. In fact, people at high risk already have, uh, get the uh, PEG product. But that would calculate to 140,000 cases of acute renal failure a year. I'm not going to argue over the um, 14 million colonoscopies because I'll be beaten up by Dr. Hadley, Hatter or, um, or Katie Couric. <laughs> and I think Katie would win. And so Abby told me to put this up because that's the best, and we don't have that, and we have a few of these, and a few of these, and one of these. And I, I have physiology, which is my only strength, um, so we don't have good studies. So this is a study from University of Pennsylvania, uh, 132 cases, there were 2,000 colonoscopies, Duration of the study was six months. They were unable to show any relationship between phosphate-related acute renal failure and the pre-exposure GFR. And that fits my way of thinking. I, I think the risk factor for this disease is having kidneys. And many of our patients don't, so um, that's good too. You can get it from uh, enemas from, uh, from below or above because you can transport phosphate uh, through the colon as well. The effect modification they did show by ACE inhibitors A or Bs, which is another way to say the kidney's ability to autoregulate has been um, thwarted. And, and this just shows you the significant factors here. Uh, age was just borderline. Um, um, the only one was really diuretic exposure. So this implies maybe uh, being vasoconstricted, pre-renal, and then getting uh, bone meal into the proximal tubule is bad. Uh, this is the Walter Reed study. Almost 10,000 colonoscopies. Their incidence was 1.6%. The creatinine of those who had renal uh, problems went from 0.95. Uh, uh, they have two digits to their creatinine, as we do. Um, the, uh, that went up to 1.71. Um, the odds ratio was 1.35. There was no effect modification by what your GFR was. The higher risk people was age, proteinuria, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, and I see cirrhosis and uh, CHF as just uh, dehydration equivalents. It's uh, poor affected plasma volume. High risk patients were more likely um, to receive the um, polyethylene glycol, which means the doctor probably was worried about giving the fleet's uh, oral phosphate as well. And in the remaining couple minutes, this study showed hypertension was a risk, heart failure. Here, there was a risk for chronic renal failure, um, diuretic use, and um, the pre-procedure creatinine was actually lower in the acute renal failure group than in the, the ones that did not. And Markowitz from Columbia, apparently, um, and Andy uh, is going to have to tell us, they biopsy everyone uh, whether they have proteinuria or not. We don't. And they biopsy 21 patients, um, and renal biopsies, uh, there were nephrocalcinosis present. That was the slide I showed you at the beginning. The risk factors were uh, female gender, age, and ACE inhibitors. The creatinine went up to 2.4, but four of them actually uh, developed end-stage renal disease uh, immediately after the sodium phosphate exposure. And the most recent study is from the archives showing a, a GFR decline of um, of 8%, but that doesn't look like much, but depending on how old you are and how long you plan to live, um, and we know kidney disease, once it starts, it has an a, a inexorable progression, so this is not a good thing either. Uh, again, these are all the risk factors. Other, I 
other people claim, and I, I think it's just having kidneys um, and exposure or the major issues. So bottom line is I think um, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Um, just go lightly through life and um, – and, or try to. Um, I guess if you get a bowel purgative, maybe uh, you ought to weigh yourself before you start and after um, – you're halfway through and after you're done and, and drink uh, something salty during the study so that you present yourself to your gastroenterologist at your, uh, at your fighting weight. Thank you. Thank you.